Yeah, Nando. I think you can start from the beginning. No? Yeah. Cool. So, yeah. So, our topic is basically on review on absorption spectra of fluorophyll in green plants and insight into non terrestrial photosynthetic pigment in uh, green uh, plants. So, yeah, first page. Next page. Next. Yeah. So as I said, photosynthesis can be divided into light reaction and dark reaction. The sum is what, what we call as photosynthesis. Light reaction from the name suggests uh, are the reaction which happens in the presence of light. So in this, uh, what happens is basically uh, the water is getting converted into oxygen in the presence of light. And this happens in the thylakoid membrane of the chloroplast. Similarly, dark reaction. Dark reaction is from the name, as the name suggests. So it is dark. So there is no need of light. So here what happens is basically carbon dioxide gets converted into glucose molecule. And this happens in uh, this happens in the stroma, I mean, a chloroplast, I mean, stroma, uh, uh, a place of the chloroplast. So overall reaction can be said as H2O plus uh, CO2 plus uh, sunlight gives you glucose plus O2. So basically, as you can see, uh, uh, it, uh, the photosynthesis, the process also prepares the food for the plant itself, and also it uh, gives oxygen, which is very need for, I mean, which is very required for us for the respiration. And the delta G, the Gibbs energy, it is uh, represented by plus 479 kilojoules per mole. And as you know, if the Gibbs energy is a positive one, it basically means it is non-spontaneous. It doesn't happen itself. So uh, this reaction has to happen from the presence of sunlight. Yeah, next. So the entire thing can be represented by this flow chart, where you can see on the extreme right side, sunlight, you, uh, you get that O2 getting converted to O2. That process is known as water splitting reaction, okay? And uh, in the second side, you can see that is something which happens in the light reaction. In the center, what you see that, CO2 getting converted into CH2O, that is something which happens in the dark reaction. Uh, and the right side, what you see O2 into H2O, that is basically what is the respiration, which is like turning up back. So, uh, uh, which is getting converted from O2 into H2O. This can be called as a carbon cycle. And this happens in all the living organisms. Yeah, next time. Next. So now, uh, structure of chlorophyll. Uh, uh, the chlorophyll, as you know, uh, the chlor there are many types of chlorophyll. Chlorophyll A, B, C, D, E, F, G. So in that, most in the plants, we see only chlorophyll A and B highly present. And the similarly, C and D are present in other bacteria and other cells. Next. Uh, now you see about carotenoids. So basically, uh, I'll, when I'll be talking about the absorption spectra, you need this uh, diagram. So just, you can look into it. So basically, as you can see, there are alternate single and double bonds uh, present in this structure. Uh, so there are various carotenoids, basically beta carotenes, zeaxanthin, uh, lutein, and everything. Yeah. But just look over the double bonds and I mean single and double bonds alternate. I'll be talking. About it. Yeah. Next. The, this is the overall diagram of the chloroplast. Uh, you are, as you can see from the in the right uh, side, second diagram B part. Uh, what the Green is uh, represented, the green dots are represented by chloroplast. And uh, this is basically, and the D part is basically thylakoid membrane of the chloroplast, which is responsible for the entire reaction to take place. Yes. Next. So this is a zoom in picture. What you see basically that stacked black color, four to six layers are basically the thylakoid membranes of the chloroplast. So there are many thylakoid which is present. So each would be uh, synthesizing its own, um, uh, I mean, CO2 to CH2O. So each one would be releasing oxygen. So yeah, next. So in this process, uh, we can see this, that uh, sunlight, this is another one more diagram. Uh, 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 so in this you see the sunlight is getting converted. Uh, sunlight is uh, basically is uh, utilized uh, to convert H2 into O2 in the thylakoid membrane. And in that process, ATP and NADPH are these are energy molecules, adenoid phosphate, are generated in the stroma. So this is something which is used in the Calvin cycle to for the conversion of uh, CO2 into CH2O. So I'll be talking this about later. So yeah, next. Now this is basically graph of absorption of chlorophyll uh, and uh, carotene. As you can uh, clearly see, chlorophyll, uh, uh, as you saw in the structure, so each absorption is basically depends on the structure and the conjugation of the double bonds. So 
so uh, in the portion of the rebel body so basically in this chlorophyll a and b basically they absorb um, a red and blue wavelength of light so what uh, they give out is same thing green color so that is the reason why see, we see most of the plants around us having green in color uh yeah even carotenoids basically they absorb red color and they will be in kind of they'll be emitting yellow color of light yeah next now talking about the chlorophyll pigment as anything uh, uh, uh anything if it is undergoing stress it will undergo a change so basically we will we are we are be seeing how the chlorophyll be undergoing various stress basically because uh, in nature everything undergoes stress the plant when it is living in a uh, environment so when it undergoes a stress like uh, temperature or drought um, salinity or um, nitrogen con uh, low nitrogen content in the soil then what happens so here you see that a dark black line on the dark black line basically it represents the control control is basically what i mean uh, what it means is basically it is not uh, not uh, posed to any stress condition it is a non stressed condition okay and the uh, white color what you see is basically in each diagram is what you see is heat uh, i mean that is basically is it is given to a stress condition so as you see the each one you can see that fluorescence is getting uh, the fluorescence is i for each of the controlled species there it can be either heat i mean temperature drought or salinity or anything so what you see is basically fluorescence is basically um, uh the uh, the excitation from the s2 uh, s1 state to x uh, s not state we shall be talking later but you can see that fluorescence uh, is basically i for a non stress condition compared to a stress condition so there is a uh, degradation of a chlorophyll pigment when it is uh, um, uh, i mean post i mean stress to i mean uh, exposed to stress factors yeah next now just talks about the uh, difference between the sun and shade leaf here you can see uh, that uh, uh, shade leaf has actually an higher fluorescence compared to a sun leaf yeah next here you see the upper side and lower side of the leaf you can uh, as you know uh, about the chlorophyll i mean uh, the way the uh, pigment i mean the exposed to the sunlight uh, the uh, uh, fluorescence in the lower side will be higher compared to the upper side of the leaf leaf uh and so they basically if there is a more fluorescence that means there is a more chlorophyll pigment which is present at that side compared to the up next so this is basically on a red and green variety basically red and green uh, variety of plant and we are, what we see is basically um the, the absorbance uh, of uh, uh, red uh, green variety is comparatively Uh, a year at the region of 680 to 700 nanometer but in the red uh, power and red that's basically uh, blue color uh, color of wavelength what we see is red variety is a year uh, giving a more absorbance than green variety next similarly we see the fluorescence of the red and green variety as you can clearly see green variety has higher fluorescence compared to a red variety of plant basically leaf okay yeah next now absorption spectrum absorption spectrum you know that there is this uh, electromagnetic spectrum which we basically divide all the uh, we are, i mean uh, wave uh, wavelength of light in the basis of either increasing wavelength or increasing frequency ranging from radio waves to uh, gamma waves where radio waves is basically it has i wavelength so as you know from the planck's equation so e is equal to h nu so inversely proportional e is equal to c by lambda when it is i wavelength it means it has low energy right so basically as uh, the radio waves as i uh, wavelength it will be having low energy similarly on the other side gamma rays as i energy what, what does that mean that means that it has low wavelength yeah next now complementary color complementary color is something which is very interesting to actually understand the uh, what we are seeing the color of what we are seeing basically what this says is basically you can see that entire color that is red orange yellow green blue violet is represented in a color wheel along with the wavelength so if a light absorption basically if any pigment any molecule because of their conjugation absorbs any particular wavelength of light the corresponding you can draw it diagonal so basically if it absorbs violet the emitted color will be yellow 
So if the compound is absorbing violet, when we see through our eyes, we don't see it is a, a violet in color. We see yellow. The corresponding that is uh, called as complementary color. Okay. So if it is a absorbing kind of red, it will be kind of a, a green color or blue color. So it will be in the range. It depends its wavelength correctly. So yeah. Next. Now we take uh, this absorption set. We all we have all seen this carrot. Uh, uh, carrot is basically kind of orange in color. Uh, carrot is basically getting that color. That is something which we are uh, observing and we are correlating with our uh, uh, chlorophyll pigment. Yeah. So basically, you can see that chlorophyll. Uh, I mean, uh, carrot is an orange in color. That is because of carotene. Next, you can see the structure of carotene. Yes. This is beta carotene, uh, which is of uh, structure basically C40H56. Uh, now you can clearly see that there are many alternate double bonds which are in series, which is from the left to right. They are the reasons basically why we see that orange color. So basically, the higher number of double bonds, the higher wavelength, and this is the the, the, uh, the there is an excitation of low, um, 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 I mean electrons. Basically, there is an excitation of pi electrons from the lowest occupied molecular orbiter, that is the ground state, to the highest uh, unoccupied electron orbiter, which is a excited uh, state. So this difference, the energy gap, the difference, what we see is basically uh, due to the, uh, that is the reason why we see the absorption of light. Uh, next. So the mechanism of absorption of light. Now we talk about mechanism of absorption. Basically, now there is photosystem one and photosystem two. Okay, uh, this photosystem one and two is basically a chlorophyll and protein complex. So at first, what we see is basically uh, there is photosystem uh, uh, two, uh, which is starting the process, and it will lead to photosystem one. As you know, as it is internal, it is basically a transfer of electrons and protons, which will lead to the process of it. What it starts is basically um, uh, there is a when um, there is a splitting of water, which is done by photosystem two. Okay, when it absorbs the sunlight, um, and this photosystem two is basically a chlorophyll protein complex. What it does to water is basically it oxidizes the water to oxygen. Similarly, it reduces the electron acceptor. Uh, next slide. Yeah. Now it is more clear what I mean. Uh, uh, so as you can clearly see uh, in the graph. Uh, so uh, yeah, photosystem two basically oxidizes water to oxygen, and it will reduce the uh, uh, electron acceptor plastoquinone into plastoquinone, and uh, this plastic ion is basically it will take the electron. What is the process? The entire process is basically the electrons uh, uh, gets transferred from photosystem two to photosystem one. In that process, there is generation of ATP and uh, NADPH, which is very required for the photosystem one for the trans uh, for the process of uh, conversion of CO2 to CH2. That is the entire process. Okay. So it starts with the photosystem two with the absorption of sunlight. And now there is a plastoquinone which will come, PQ, which can be it is represented. And this oxidizes plastoquinone into plastoquinone. And it also reduces plastocyanate. And that is the first type which goes with the photosystem one in the photosystem two. And in the second, second uh, light driven reaction, we see, photo, we see photosystem one, which will oxidize uh, plastocyanate and it will reduce the ferrodoxin protein. In that process, basically, there is an enzyme called as pyridoxin NADPH reductase enzyme. Use the both energy molecules, that is ATP and NADPH. In this, uh, the base rising and reducing process, we get this generation of this energy uh, molecules, which are required. So this is called as uh, the electron transfer factor. Uh, next, uh, did you see? Oh, yeah, yeah, I got it. Yeah. So now, um, as I said, uh, so um, I, uh, we can give it thermodynamic explanation. So basically, Gibbs free energy is the remaining uh, amount of energy which can be done, converted to a useful uh, any amount of work. So 
as i said if you have observed i said for all the molecules there is corresponding an oxidizing process and a reducing process so what is a redox reaction as the name suggests there is a reducing process and oxidizing process which is involved with that reaction so there is something which is getting oxidized and something which is getting reduced so uh, uh, there uh, uh, the scientists uh, uh, scientists try to get an uh, uh, gibbs energy of the reaction the electron transfer pathway what they took is basically as you know uh, uh, if you want to find uh, the, there is a relation that is gibbs energy is equal to minus nfp where uh, n is the number of electrons and f is the faraday constant and e is the emf or the redox potential in this case so we took the uh, 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 i mean emf the redox potential uh, of the electron acceptor minus electron donor so in the general case we see that is e, e cathode minus e anode but here it is taken as e acceptor minus e donor and we see that when uh, for the left extreme left case of the previous diagram what we saw uh, there is a, this for overall light reaction to take place we need the water oxygen couple that uh, donor to be of plus 820 millivolt and in the right side extreme right where a dark reaction happens for the conversion of CH2O, i mean uh, glucose molecule um, there uh, we need this um, uh, the redox potential at that uh, in places minus 320 millivolt when we subtract this we get basically uh, so it is in the process of negative so we get minus 1140 millivolt ionic reaction basically when you get a positive sign it just non spontaneous it doesn't happen itself okay yeah next slide so now as i said so basically the photosynthesis is looks from outside that is basically it is a conversion of uh, co2 into ch2 but internally i said as you see that there is an excitation and uh, a de excitation uh, and there is also a transfer of electrons now this transfer of electrons can be, be um, uh, uh, represented by a jablonski diagram basically it is a diagram which will illustrate the electronic state uh, it's of a molecule and also the transitions between them here s not s1 s2 s not is a ground state s1 is the uh, uh, first state which will be uh, our the state which uh, will lead only when the a uh, chlorophyll molecule absorbs the red photons of light, okay uh, red photons of light that is around uh, 680 to 700 nanometer and s2 is basically uh, 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 excited state which, which will take place only when the photon chlorophyll will absorb blue photon of light that is indicated by the blue color and the red arrow so uh, as i said basically as chlorophyll a and b absorbs red and blue so they have to be corresponding red and blue uh, excited states right so there are two different excited states one is for red and one is for blue so in the first case what you see is basically uh, uh, when uh, uh, chlorophyll molecule is incident i mean it is exposed to red uh, it goes to x1 state and similarly if it is exposed to blue it goes to s2 state uh, they are corresponding excited states of the chlorophyll molecule okay? it is represented and uh, as you know that the energy is the inversely proportional to stability so if there is high amount of energy it is going to be least stable okay uh, so uh, what you see is basically s2 is an high amount of excited state than uh, s1 so it is high energy so it is kind of highly unstable so what it will do anything which is unstable uh, should will emit the energy and such that it can come in low in energy such that i stable okay so there is a, a happening of internal conversion what is internal conversion is basically it will shift from s2 to s1 state okay and then when it reaches s1 state there is a, it is again excited state but it is com uh, compared to s2 it is comparatively lower in amount of energy so it can be kind of um, average stable okay it is not highly unstable but yeah okay it can manage there there is a happening of i mean at this s1 we can see two or three other pathways it cannot die i mean there are other routes for the path so here in from s1 it can undergo it can go back to s0 and that can be called as a fluorescence and similarly this from s1 it can transfer to an another chlorophyll excited molecule and similarly the energy can be transferred from one molecule to another molecule okay so this can be given by an analogy so if i want to say you if someone gets uh, for example if some person x gets angry 
he can insert cool in, i mean he can cool himself down calm his down and he can uh, i mean if he gets angry so he can calm his down cool his anger or that can be represented by fluorescence or he can shift that energy by shouting at other person and making the other person getting angry so that he person becomes excited and that there is a transfer of energy that is something which you can understand so it is easy yeah so that is something so basically in the chlorophyll molecule what you see is basically you see both a person cooling himself some chlorophyll molecules will cool themselves down also the other molecules will shout at other people and they will be transferring the energy also there is corresponding both will be happening because we need the electrons to get transferred from the photosystem 2 to photosystem 1 right yeah so let's like yeah so here what i said basically the transfer thing between the chlorophyll molecules is if you see that s0 to s1 so s1 it has reached from s2 to s1 right so now from s1 it can undergo to s1 to s0 that is fluorescence or it can get transferred to s1 or the other excited molecule um, uh, of the chlorophyll and it the energy can be getting transferred and this can be uh, uh, said as eat that is uh, um, excited energy transfer okay and uh, likewise the energy gets transferred but in this case it is there is condition for that excited so as we can say so if we have to show it has to be the same level right so basically this s1 and the s1 of the next molecule chlorophyll a second and chlorophyll one molecule should be of the same orientation and they should be having the same amount of energy the excited correct amount of energy such that the energy gets transferred if it there is a mismatch it will undergo fluorescence it will not transfer the energy okay it is highly specific Uh, so it will not uh, give it itself. So if it has to give, it should be of same orientation and it should be of the same energy. So that are the two condition for the transfer of uh, energy from one chlorophyll molecule to another molecule. So in that way, there is we can see that excited chlorophyll donor to an uh, ground state of uh, uh, another chlorophyll molecule, which will act as acceptor. So one which is excited highly, it can be called as donor, and one which is acceptor. Yeah. Next. Yeah. So in this. Uh, Uh, by this uh, we can see that um, um, photosynthesis that uh, when uh, photosynthesis is a combined process of light reactions and dark reactions where light reactions happens in the thylakoid membrane of chlorophyll and dark reactions happens in the stoma and uh, in light reaction we see water splitting reaction and dark reaction we see the conversion of co2 into glucose molecule and also we saw that how this uh, Uh, chlorophyll uh, pigment when it is absorbed to various stress condition the fluorescence what i was explained you now actually decreases okay so there the, there is a chlorophyll degradation when there is exposed to stress conditions like drought salinity or high temperature and then we saw all the complementary color so anything what you observe seeing now is not something which is getting absorbed that light is getting absorbed it is something which is light is getting uh, emitted that is something which you see it is emitted right so it is emitted from the object so that is something what we see and i took an example of carrot to explain the same so what you see so from now when you see something like a uh, uh, carrot the orange color that is something because of the presence of carotene molecule the uh, uh, double bonds and there is the transfer of uh, from uh, lower stoichiometric uh, molecular orbital to highest stoichiometric electron orbital and uh, last we saw that debrandt's kind of diagram how it explains the transfer of molecule from one molecule to another and similarly the fluorescence basically cooling himself down also yeah. i hand over to ari for the next uh, volume two. uh sagar can you make me the co host yeah i did i did do co host Uh, so is my screen visible yeah it is yeah uh, so you have seen uh, in um, the part one of uh, our uh, our work uh, in which we speak about the uh, fluorescence of uh, chlorophyll and uh, uh, the uh, mean so we uh we will look into the you can see in our chlorophyll so like in uh, our case we have uh, there are four types of uh, usually there are four types 
the chlorophyll A and B, C, D. So we can consider the chlorophyll B and A. So here you can see that in um, in the range of around 500 to 600 nanometers, uh, uh, the chlorophyll do not absorb uh, any of these uh, wavelengths uh, strongly. Now, uh, technically speaking, if a process is photo um, uh, photon driven or light based, then uh, the usual assumption is the more the light, the merrier. But uh, that's not what we see in this case. So here on the uh, in figure B, we have uh, the solar spectrum. So the regions in the red are uh, uh, the black body spectrum of our sun uh, has seen from the earth and uh, uh, these dashed lines uh, show the uh, visible region. So when you actually see our sun being a, a G2 type star, um, it's a maximum wavelength peaks in the green region. So that's somewhere around 500 to uh, let's say around 600 uh, to 650 nanometers. So here we can see a correlation uh, that uh, the maximum region that our star attains, maximum wavelength region are not absorbed by plants on the earth. Now, why is that? Uh, let's see further. So one reason that uh, we uh, conclude is uh, photosynthesis being a, a photo pigment driven uh, reaction. It can actually produce free radicals uh, in, uh, in the process of uh, photosynthesis. And uh, free radicals, as we say, they are uh, in excess amounts um, dangerous to the plant. So they can damage uh, cell membranes and uh, nucleic acids uh, and uh, uh, most important uh, parts of the plant. So that's not what a plant that is surviving wants. So in and uh, excess of light can also induce photodegradation and photoxidation uh, of chlorophyll. So that's uh, not what a plant would like to do. Uh, so that's one reason. On the other hand, uh, we did refer to a paper uh, or paper wherein the researchers uh, uh, concluded by saying that protection mechanism, uh, the, uh, the absorption gap was a protection mechanism against fluctuation of light. So on earth, you can actually see that the light fluctuates uh, over the day uh, from morning, uh, from dawn to dusk. Uh, so on the other hand, uh, when you uh, also, uh, the plants have evolved to prevent the damage of photocenters. For example, like in uh, seen in chloroplast, uh, excess of light can actually damage. Them. Also, these researchers have actually modeled um, a particular, uh, uh, they have a model wherein they took uh, two uh, peaks, uh, two wavelengths of uh, two different colors, uh, uh, close to the maximum region. And then uh, by averaging out the energy, uh, they uh, so and uh, they drew a graph uh, which shows the maximum to uh, minimum energy intensity uh, variation so uh, by this uh, they concluded uh, by doing so they saw that uh, when the wavelengths two wavelengths are much closer to each other the, the amount of energy that a plant can receive is much more higher which can damage the plant but whereas if, if um, the two wavelengths are the plant doesn't receive a lot of light and it can uh, hinder the growth of the plant. And there's this particular sweet spot wherein two uh, perfect uh, wavelengths uh, can uh, come together, can be averaged out such that the energy al almost remains the same. As you have seen, a photosynthesis being a, a light-driven process does require a particular amount of energy uh, to break the bonds of uh, water, to combine it with the uh, to break the bond of carbon dioxide and then to form glucose and ATP and stuff. Uh, when you talk about taking these, uh, um, gap, this particular gap has an exa uh, has to our advantage, you might have heard of growth LEDs, which specifically target uh, on um, growing plants uh, relatively faster. So this is actually a, a proven proven technique which uh, people do employ in certain regions where you don't exactly get a lot of sunlight and uh, indoor planting uh, is more popular. So here you can see these uh, lights which is more reddish blue in color. Uh, so by 
the absorption spectra, you can actually see that the chlorophyll actually absorbs mainly in the blue and uh, the red region. So that's one reason why they actually use these particular plants. And um, if you alone use the red light or if you alone use the blue light, it doesn't act exactly help um, as much. It doesn't increase the biomass of the plant. So research has been done on uh, various plants, like for example, uh, uh, important ones like soya bean and stuff. So wherein they saw that um, using red light only doesn't help in increasing the biomass, but using a particular combination of uh, red and blue light does help in uh, increasing the biomass of the plant in uh, similar conditions. On the other hand, uh, since uh, we know that uh, chlorophyll being uh, a particular uh, photopigment dye, uh, it can uh, absorb uh, certain frequencies of uh, wavelength uh, of light. So it is possible to actually use them in uh, dye lasers and uh, we can get a, a certain frequency of uh, a light, a uh, laser light, which can be used in certain applications uh, for uh, certain excitementation or uh, bioprocesses or uh, many other processes. So here is a schematic of our uh, basic uh, dye laser, uh, which uh, has, which can, uh, instead of the dye here, we can actually use uh, chlorophyll. Now, uh, when you look into the role of cyanobacteria, so cyanobacteria were one of the most uh, earliest uh, uh, single cell organism to be found on earth uh, when earth was a few million a billion years old so uh, cyanobacteria are just uh, bacteria which can photosynthesize on their own and they convert uh, uh, like carbon dioxide and uh, water into sugars and uh, they give out uh, a lot of oxygen so have you have has you seen in uh, part uh, uh, part one uh, the role of uh, photosystem one and two is very much more vital and uh, these photosystems would have most likely first evolved in um, uh, cyanobacteria and then they might have uh, evolved in a fashion to further uh, to be developed uh, in plants. Now great oxidation event is uh, an event that took place around 4 point, uh, uh, 2.4 bil uh, billion years ago wherein uh, the atmosphere, the concentration of oxygen in our atmosphere was far more greater than uh, uh, most of the other gases, uh, which uh, led to uh, enriching our atmosphere with uh, a lot of oxygen. So uh, that actually goes to uh, cyanobacteria and the oldest uh, uh, fossil so, found, uh, so far found was around uh, dated around 1.9 billion years ago. But uh, you see here the great oxidation event actually took place 2.4 billion years ago. So there's this uh, uh, gap in between uh, these two time periods. So what exactly happened over here? So certain uh, researchers conclude uh, by saying that most likely we don't exactly see uh, the same cyanobacteria that we found that we can find now here on uh, in the current time. Maybe we might have seen an uh, ancestral uh, 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 cyanobacteria, which uh, might have uh, actually uh, given, uh, uh, had a big role in the great oxidation event. Um, here, when we actually talk about cyanobacteria fossils, there's an issue. Uh, like, and we cannot exactly say that uh, the chlorophyll that we have seen now might have been present long ago in those uh, bacteria. So most likely certain people say that uh, certain researchers also conclude uh, by saying that uh, most likely it's possible that uh, there were certain uh, photosynthetic pigments, uh, a few uh, like initially when the uh, first uh, microorganisms uh, came into existence on earth and that might have evolved into the current uh, uh, chlorophyll and the other uh, uh, photopigments that we see on uh, the earth now. Now, uh, when you talk about uh, life on other planet, uh, which is a big puzzle on its own, uh, there are certain factors that uh, are uh, most likely found in certain uh, places. 
So when you look at the HR diagram, uh, which actually is a plot of uh, the class of the star and the temperature and uh, the um, type of the star and the magnitude of the star, it uh, mainly tells you uh, that uh, uh, certain stars uh, like our own sun uh, are uh, belonging to the main sequence. So these are the main sequence stars, which um, readily fuse uh, uh, hydrogen into helium in their core. And then further on, they go on to fuse other elements and then they diverge from the main sequence. So main sequence over here plays an important role in our uh, paper, only because we need to select certain stars which can live long enough uh, to sustain life on the planet. So here are the requirements. So type of the star plays an important role uh, because uh, further on you will actually see why. So the lifespan of the star also is important because you don't want uh, to life just start off on a rocky planet uh, and then the sun going supernova or uh, entering its uh, giant stage. So that's not uh, what we want to look into, uh, look into this. Uh, energy received by the planet from the star. So here the distance uh, from the host star plays an important role because uh, you need to keep a planet warm for certain reactions to occur or even for water to be in the liquid state. And uh, yeah, like in uh, the distance from the planet, uh, of the planet from the star is also an important thing. So here, when we talk about uh, the main sequence stars, they are actually classified into different uh, classes from O, B, A, F, G, K, M. So our sun is a G type star whose average uh, temperature, surface temperature lies between 5,000 uh, to 6,000 Kelvin. So here you can actually see uh, the color of the star, the mass, the approximate mass of the star and the radius and the luminosity. So here the approximate uh, lifespan actually matters in our case. So keeping Earth as a base line, uh, we can actually conclude that uh, life might have taken uh, roughly uh, the roughly around two billion years or one billion year to evolve uh, on a planet with sufficient resources. So in our case, we cannot exactly consider ten million years because uh, uh, our Earth. Uh, the first life found on Earth would have been around three to two billion years ago. So uh, then the most likely candidates would be F, F class star, which uh, whose lifespan is around five billion years. And then uh, comes G, uh, G type, that is our, uh, uh, our sun type of stars, which is around uh, whose life falls around 10 billion years. Then K type, which is 50 billion years. And then uh, uh, M type, which is 100 billion years uh, star. So now uh, we will look into F, G, K, and M type of stars. So here, when you talk about habitable zone, it's just a zone uh, or a distance from a particular star wherein uh, the planet, host planet, can actually uh, keep water uh, in the form of liquid. Uh, so here you can see in the red regions, it's too hot for water to actually be in its liquid state and uh, here on the other hand we have a cold region wherein uh, the water tends to freeze off uh, then here this is actually a f type star then followed by a g and then a k and uh, in the end we have an m type star so here we can actually see that the habitable zone which is given in the green color uh, slightly varies as we uh, a lot i mean varies by a lot when we move from um, the higher mass star to the lowest mass star. So here uh, we have our Earth, which uh, is found uh, for a, a G-type star. So our sun is being a G-type star has, uh, uh, and uh, our Earth actually falls in the habitable zone. So you can actually see that for, for as we go, uh, in, as we decrease the mass of the star, the region actually tends to go much closer to the star. Now, when we talk about F and G type stars, here are uh, some uh, spectral uh, data on uh, a certain uh, uh, F, F type and G type uh, class stars. Here we can actually see that the peak region uh, is roughly around in the blue region. 
So here in this case, uh, we can in a way conclude uh, by using our uh, earlier assumptions that uh, plants, if at all, uh, the uh, plants or any photosynthetic uh, pigment uh, that can be found on a planet uh, with this host star will not primarily absorb in the blue, uh, blue region. So it would uh, average out the energy that uh, beyond the blue region and it would uh, look more or less bluish in color, bluish or purplish in color because it uh, emits, uh, uh, I mean, it doesn't absorb the blue region colors, uh, but whereas it can absorb the others. Now, uh, the perfect example for a G-class star is our own sun and uh, is our own uh, uh, planet uh, with uh, chlorophyll as the best example as we can say so far now. So here you can see that here uh, in uh, this, uh, the approximately it's around 450 to uh, 500 uh, nanometers. So in this way, you can see that it doesn't exactly absorb in the uh, greenish region. So plants uh, in, in general case look green in color. Now, when you talk about the other uh, class stars, uh, the distance uh, from the star actually uh, starts to matter a lot. Tidally locked zone. Uh, so this tidally locked word is just, it just means that uh, the planets, one face of the planet will actually face the sun uh, and the other face will uh, not even look at the sun. It will always be on uh, diagonally opposite to the uh, the region that uh, st uh, looks at the sun. So our moon is a best example uh, uh, because most of the times you will actually uh, see uh, the same face of the moon uh, and you will not see the other, uh, the dark region of the moon, so to say. So here we have an uh, F, class, uh, F uh, class star. And uh, uh, if I zoom in, you can actually see this blue dot represents Earth. So you can actually see for a G type star, Earth uh, lies in the habitable zone. This white, this white band is the habitable zone. And these lines represent the, uh, the tidal uh, re radius, the tidally locked radius, so to say. So you, we know actually that uh, Mercury is tightly locked uh, to our sun. So here we can see that it's beyond this band, uh, the central band. So on the other hand, when you actually see the K-type star, uh, for example, uh, its habitable zone and the tightly locked zone actually overlaps in uh, K and M-type stars. So here uh, we get to see uh, something called as uh, eyeball effect. So wherein one side of the planet is always facing the star and the other side doesn't exactly face the star and you get to see a region uh, with varying intensity. So the side which is facing the star will have higher temperature uh, when compared to the region that is not facing the star. So you will actually tend to see a gradient uh, when you pass over the surface of the star, I mean the planet. So in the case of K uh, type, here you can see that uh, a comparison uh, between uh, uh, our own sun's uh, absorption uh, emission spectra and uh, some of the other K type uh, stars. You can actually see that there's a small deviation uh, difference in the wavelengths and these usually fall under uh, the same uh, more or less the green and the uh, yellow region. So in this case, in this particular case, um, um, we can in a way say that it is possible for certain uh, photosynthetic pigments which do not absorb this particular wavelength can uh, exist uh, using the same uh, averaging uh, energy uh, model. Uh, we can actually say that they will absorb the other wavelengths uh, in this case, and then they can actually uh, uh, not absorb the unwanted uh, large bands of energy and on the other hand we have an m class uh, star and here you can actually see that uh, m class stars are uh, red in color so they mostly they have uh, uh, higher peaks in uh, the red region and uh, beyond the red region so here in this case uh, there would be uh, two cases uh, uh, to be spoken uh, in certain cases, it is possible that uh, the plant can uh, omit this particular uh, red region, provided it can um, sustain itself on the other uh, wavelengths, excluding uh, red color. 
but in the case where it can't survive uh, only on the other uh, uh, colors uh, then it would opt to absorb all the uh, all the wavelengths in the visible spectrum so it will more or less look uh, uh, dark black in color or uh, a, a darkish hue the leaf, uh, the photosynthetic uh, pigment now when you talk about even our own earth it's not like we can only find chlorophyll right so there are many other uh, photosynthetic pigment like uh, like um, anandu mentioned the uh, beta carotenes and uh, other uh, phycocyanins and uh, they all absorb in different uh, fre uh, frequency uh, ranges and uh, wavelength ranges so what is the main reason in this case so it one could be an evolutionary factor which actually plays a, a role in uh, select making these certain uh, bacteria for example or plants in certain regions uh, which are stressed uh, to adapt in a certain way to absorb certain frequencies of wavelength because we still do find uh, same um, algae is of different colors uh, so yeah so given time and uh, proper resources certain uh, similar pigments can be developed even on an extraterrestrial planet uh, provided given time because as we know that earth has seen quite a lot many extinction great uh, events so expecting complex life would not be um, complex life similar to humans won't exactly be possible so but in on the other hand we can expect uh, similar uh, single cell organisms to actually evolve like for example in the case of uh, um, cyanobacteria even on a external uh, exo non terrestrial planet given time and resources so now i will hand it over to anandu uh, to give a short note on the summary yes uh, so yeah uh, we would like to summarize by saying that uh, photosynthetic pigments chlorophyll and carotenoids they basically absorb complementary color and that is what we see and uh, so also we see that chlorophyll a and b basically they absorb red and blue that is basically far, far end right so basically other end, end so red and blue the low energy and high energy and in that process we can actually see that our nature itself has selected in the mechanisms as that they are cancelling out the excess energy with the lower energy and they are trying to go with the lower energy for the photosynthesis and also we would like to continue our further work in this complex and also as i have uh, as we both explained uh, so basically if any complex is absorbing any color and they are emitting so we see that is because of the effective conjugation you can see between the chlorophyll for molecules there are many double bonds because of that presence of double bonds and their excitation is something what we see so we would like to explore more on that and also try to get a better understanding on how or the threshold energy which is required for the excitation of chlorophyll molecule as we know what kind of wavelength is better for the process and uh, for the process of photosynthesis and next slide yeah so uh, putting it correctly on to two statements uh, our future work we have two plans so uh, first plan is basically we want to explore why the chlorophyll has been taken as a dominant uh, uh, photosynthetic pigment across many plants starting from the blue green algae as ari mentioned as a course of evolution in organisms like bacteria and how it got selected and uh, try to explore the reason and uh, try to get the better idea of it and also the second um, as i explained um, the photosynthesis starts with the photosystem 2 then it starts with the photosystem 1 so but uh, the process of photosynthesis 2 uh, photosystem 2 uh, leads to the uh, transfer of electrons and that is required for the uh, the synthesis of energy molecules like atp and adp which are required for photosynthesis 1 photosystem 1 so in a way you can see that both photosystems are uh, interdependent yeah so they can't be like performing any one so photosystem Two as to perform first, then for system one. So we want to try it, uh, and um, I mean we want to assume it like independent oscillators and uh, try to uh, get any mathematical interpretation from the energy density and wavelength of light. And also, as we know that uh, for the red and blue, what photon? I mean, uh, what energy we can get for one mole? And uh, try to explore more thermodynamics part of it and uh, get a better idea of it. that is our idea for our future work so we have two plans 
and uh, next yeah last but not the least we would like to thank uh, sagar and uh, vikrant for teaching us this latex course very beautifully uh, and also the uh, organizing sitara and entire nakshatra team without which uh, this work uh, i mean developing a project in latex would have been impossible also for the a uh, nice interactive uh, uh, friends uh, who who are, who are joined for this course uh, i mean we got to understand many things from just uh, seeing the doubts of other students so we got clarity and also for the a big thanks for all the ones who have joined today and also not for the ones who are not joined because of the busy schedule uh, yeah it was a nice uh, journey uh, we liked it and uh, yeah thank you for everyone thank you anandu and hariyaran for a good presentation uh, so firstly uh does anyone have doubts okay i see one doubt in uh, chat box uh, bacteria with different species or genus absorb different wavelength like in a question mark so does bacteria with different species species and genus absorb different wavelength so yeah so i will answer that uh... so in generality when you actually see uh, it's not exactly like that so chlorophyll uh, uh, pigment is actually found in uh, most of the blue green algae so it's not exactly like uh, one particular species of uh, blue green algae or uh, uh, cyanobacteria aka cyanobacteria uh, do absorb one particular wavelength it's not it's not, it's not exactly like that it's more or less like the pigment uh, which uh, is commonly shared among uh, most of the bacteria uh, which uh, selectively uh, absorb certain wavelengths unless and until there is a selective uh, pressure on the bacteria it doesn't exactly absorb uh, different wavelengths because here uh, on earth you can actually you do find regions which have these uh, purple bacteria uh, which absorb uh, different uh, wavelength regions so in that case they have a different photosynthetic pigment only because of uh, uh, their uh, different requirements so it's mainly like a selective based thing but uh, in our case we started off with uh, uh, cyanobacteria only because uh, the main dominant photosynthetic pigment that you see is chlorophyll uh, even in plants per se or uh, in cyanobacteria if you actually see and uh, there is more evidence backing uh, to say that uh, uh, it's most likely that cyanobacteria is where one of the first uh, uh, organisms to actually develop or uh, to have uh, build up these uh, uh, photosynthetic pigments most likely it might not be like uh, the current uh, chlorophyll that we see it need not be uh, but something similar or maybe something uh, more or less the same yeah yeah and the question has continued like uh... also through evolution is there any specific pattern of absorbing different wavelength that bacteria develop or something to efficiently carry activity uh not exactly when you see uh, the uh, there's no proper uh, fossil evidence to back uh, certain things because uh, these uh, dyes uh, as we said um, they do decay uh, they are uh, biological right so they do decay over time so fossilize uh, expecting them to be fossilized and then uh, uh, to get out uh, the structure is very difficult because the structure would determine uh, in which wavelength region does it actually absorb right so uh, when you base it off our own conclusions uh, it's most likely that uh, uh, the role of the star is more prominent uh, overall uh, Uh, and then uh, when you uh, talk in uh, look into certain other algae uh, which do uh, which are found in different colors uh, in those cases uh, we'll actually see that they are under water most of the time they are under water so uh, penetration of light uh, plays an important role over there and then uh, uh, then we know we know that uh, uh, red light has more penetration over uh, blue right uh, so that would also be a selective kind of a thing but overall when you see uh, the role of the star the type of the star the color of the star plays a predominant role in this case 
Yeah, I hope that answered your question. Yeah, I know. So then, uh, can you guys show your paper like how it is? Let's see. Once. So. One, like share your screen and e, go through the paper. Yeah, one second. Uh, Anandu, do you want to share first? Hello, Anandu. Yeah, yeah, Sh I'll share it. Sagar, can you take one question for me? From me? Yeah, uh, please go on. Uh, Sagar, are, are you able to listen to me, Hari? Yeah, yeah, yeah I'm. Okay, I'm sure. Go on. I can listen. Yeah, yeah. yeah. See, uh, uh, it's very nice presentation. Thank you. See, as you said, uh, photosynthesis is a uh, light driven uh, process. So, uh, I just want to change the language a little bit. So, let us say photosynthesis is a uh, EM radiation driven process in blue and red wavelength regime or frequency regime. Is that correct? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Even okay. that is correct. Yeah. Yeah. So, now I come to my questions. You see, over the, you see, on a diurnal cycle, entire day. So we have visible light or maybe that uh, blue and red is available only maximum 12 hours. But whereas for entire 24 hours, we have infrared and uh, higher wavelength available. It has been happening uh, throughout the history of the earth. So any biochemical reasons why uh, the plants have not evolved, which have uh, learned to to deal with you know this uh, higher level, uh, I mean uh, lower frequency higher level and uh, infrared and beyond, rather than depending only on uh, blue and uh, red. Uh, do you get my question? Yeah, because I got the it. Avail yeah. Because the availability of the EM radiations in that frequency range has been almost double than the what is the availability within the the the, the within the blue and uh, uh, and red. So what what, what can be the regions? Yeah, so uh, when you actually look into uh, photosynthetic pigments, so for example, or uh, when you look into uh, colored pigments, there are certain uh, pigments which absorb close to uh, near UV regions, but not beyond that, because then you start getting these uh, uh, UV based uh, photo oxidation and all. So it's most likely near uh, uh, UV to near infrared regions. Uh, now, when you talk about energy distribution, uh, for example, uh, the energy of photons that uh, we get to see in uh, regions beyond visible region are pretty much low because these photons don't exactly have a lot of energy. And uh, most of the processes that, uh, that we see on Earth does require a certain amount of energy. So like uh, uh, Anandu pointed out uh, saying that there's a particular uh, specific uh, potential that you do require to break the bonds between uh, uh, f for say hydrogen or uh, oxygen. So it's most likely like that. Uh, so since uh, the amount of energy that you can get uh, in regions uh, less than visible light uh, don't have a lot of energy, even though the amount of uh, the photon density might be more, the energy still uh, has a play uh, has a role to play in this. Okay. okay. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. So as you said, uh, energy is the driving process in that. So basically, yes. Yeah. It's. Yeah. So you guys can share your uh, paper. I mean, share your screen. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Uh, I'm sharing it. Uh, I hope it will be fine. Yeah. Uh, this is the, can you see the uh, screen? Yeah, I can see the screen. Yeah, cool. Uh, so thank you. Yeah, so this is uh, basically a volume one paper. Yeah, uh, basically where we explore the absorption spectra and all that and um, yeah. This is uh, so here we mentioned the introduction of photosynthesis, how it happens, and uh, the light reaction, dark reaction, and the overall reaction, and also the global uh, carbon cycle. And then we move into the chloroplast and how basically from a plant, how from outside what we see, what is the inner thing which is leading to the, uh, you, as you can see from the D uh, thing uh, marked, 
the thylakoid membrane of the chloroplast, which is the main uh, player in our game. So as you can see now, um, so they are responsible for the, so you can uh, clearly see from this diagram. So there is thylakoid membrane, I mean, which is represented by uh, grana, which is represented by black color stacks and the uh, other things which are represented by kind of gray. So there is something which is happening, uh, dark reaction and the stacks is something where it happens light reaction. So this is the combined process of light and dark. And uh, then uh, we saw, we are seeing the different carotenoid structure, then types of chlorophyll. As I said, uh, there are not only chlorophyll A and B molecules, there are different molecules only, but uh, the, the chlorophyll A and B are most found in majority in plants and the other ones in the bacteria and other. And the function of chlorophyll, as I mentioned, the entire chart, the light and dark. And um, there is basically a transfer of electrons, basically. So if you want to see from outside, it is just a photosynthesis conversation, but uh, from internal, it is full of transfer of electrons from excited to ground and all that. And uh, then we see how chlorophyll, when it is for, uh, for I mean, uh, exposed to different stress conditions, changes, fluorescence decreases. And this goes with the sun and shade leaf, red and green variety. And the uh, upper and lower side. So this is basically, I took it because to uh, explain why the fluorescence decreases, particularly in that. So as a uh, uh, doubt came up, it is uh, selective with respect to the energy is the driving process. And this is basically the metabolism plants, which has the entire flow chart, I think it is, yeah. And uh, yeah, so this is the physics of chlorophyll where we basically see how particularly uh, they absorb a characteristic particular wavelength and which are required for their excitation because it's Gibbs energy connected. And uh, yeah, so this uh, this basically represents the types of chlorophyll with the presence and occurrence where we see, as I said, chlorophyll A and B with plants and C and D with algae and all that. Then we get into the absorption spectra. So as I explained, the uh, global ice age time, billions of years, how it, it's converted and all. Then uh, about the plant photosystem, system, the Z, this is something which is very important. This is how it happens, the electron transport, yeah. So again, it is a redox potential. From this, we calculate the Gibbs energy and get to know the transfer, electron transfer. Uh, I think this process uh, explains the entire thing. You can see photosystem two, it starts and it ends with photosystem one. So it's like driving process from thylakoid to stroma of the chloroplast. And uh, the thermodynamics relation of getting 220 kilojoules for a acid is endogonic reaction and all. And then we take the Jablonskoy diagram where we represent the electronic transition which is happening and how it gets transferred from one chlorophyll molecule to another. And yeah, so this is detailed of S0 to S1, so between. Yeah. And the conclusion, as I said, uh, the averaging of um, energy and uh, how uh, chlorophyll, uh, I mean, the degradation because when it uh, undergoes to stress. And yeah, so this is my reference. Yeah, so that's it. Yeah, so can I share it now, Sagar? Yeah, you can share. Yeah. So here is the contents. So then abstract, then introduction, just basics of what is uh, photosynthesis and stuff. Then here comes the absorption spectral gap. And then here I go about explaining why uh, is the gap even there. And then I start comparing it with the solar spectrum. Then here uh, I have two. Uh, I've referred uh, two papers uh, which speak about uh, uh, damage caused due to excess of light, and the other hand, uh, the model uh, that uh, uh, takes two wavelengths and tries to average out the energy. To then uh, growth LEDs as to how uh, we can take advantage of this uh, spectral gap. And then I talk about uh, saying that 80% blue and 20% red would be the optimal uh, uh, 
uh, ratio for the light led then i talk about i cite a paper and i talk about uh, uh, dye lasers uh, wherein they use uh, chlorophyll as their dye here then uh, here i talk about cyan cyanobacteria evolution and uh, um what role it played in early life evolution then here comes uh, hr diagram so i explain what is hr diagram and main sequence stars okay. then here i talk about the how to calculate the uh, life life span of a particular star and then i show the table uh, which already has the all the stuff calculated for different uh, uh, classes of star then here i talk about habitable zone and then its variation uh, then i go on to talk about f class f class star then g then uh, k then i talk about m class star and then the two possible ways wherein the color can be red and uh, or even um, black then here i talk about uh, how uh, evolution and uh, selective uh, selectivity plays a role on even on earth where we can develop different uh, uh, photosynthetic pigments by then i have my conclusion yeah then these are the references yeah so is that okay uh, thank you arhiran and uh, anandu uh, i ask vikrant to give his views finally vikrant if you're here yeah can you hear me yeah vikrant so my net is a little glitchy so my voice may break here and there uh, please excuse me for that uh, okay so it was a very good presentation i thoroughly enjoyed uh, both the topics volume 1 and volume 2 and uh, based on our previous discussions i've always uh, expressed that this topic fascinated me quite a bit uh, because you're dealing with something that is taught to us in elementary school you know photosynthesis chlorophyll sunlight is converted to energy that's the food for plants and stuff and uh, thanks to your projects uh, you know all of us here who've been in this meeting and who will watch it on youtube later on uh, i'm sure that they'll get a new perspective of how else can you analyze this entire uh, situation of photosynthesis with chlorophyll and uh, sort of expand our uh, understanding of of photosynthesis and so on uh, the presentation was very good i i just have a few comments that i'd like to make uh, so that you guys uh, learn from uh, the experience that you've had here. Uh, right. So uh, while you're presenting, uh, I've, I've told this to the previous batches as well who have presented already. And if anyone here is about to present next from the LaTeX batch, uh, please make sure you, uh, uh, you know, enforce this in your presentation. References and citations must be present in your PPT as well. All right. Uh, just because you've put them in your paper doesn't mean that you need not put them in your presentation because your, your PPT, your presentation is a summary of your paper, right? Which means you are supposed, if, if it was a larger crowd and you're doing this on a much more professional space uh, where you have a hundred people listening to you in some conference or something like that, uh, then it's, it, it shows uh, when, when you put your references inside your PPT as well, it shows that you've actually looked up stuff, right? Now your reference right now might be just your paper. Right. But in your paper, you still have referred to other things and you should show that in your presentation as well, because people are not going to read. Not everyone is going to read your paper. Right. That's that's a hard fact that is there. Not everyone's going to read your paper, but the ones who do uh, read your paper are the ones who have attended your presentation. Right. And that brings me to my next point. The content of the presentations were really good. Right. And, and like I said, it, it, it is to the it is due to the fact that the topic was really interesting, uh, but this is just a small advice that you shouldn't reveal everything in the presentation, right? Because in that, what, when you do that, what happens is people will understand everything that you've done and no one will look at your paper, right? Even if someone's really interested, uh, if, and if they've attended your presentation, then, 
if you if you reveal too much in your ppt then they'll think hey this is all there is to it there's nothing new in the papers so i'm not going to look at the paper but then you never know there might be something new in the paper but they don't look at it because you've covered so much in your ppt that they feel like that's everything right so don't reveal too much in your presentation unless uh, you've made a new discovery altogether right like if you've done a hardcore experiment and you've gotten some really fascinating results that time it's a good idea to reveal everything right uh, you know starting from what your hypothesis is and what you did to set up the experiment uh, what were the conditions what were the drawbacks what were the you know uh, difficulties you faced and finally the, the results right that makes sense right uh, but in a paper like this uh, and and you know any other review projects that you might go ahead and do review or reading projects uh don't reveal everything in your presentation keep some surprise for your paper as well so that people actually go back and read papers now there's two benefits to that as well right one is you have a shorter presentation so you can keep well with any sort of a time constraint second is the reader whoever reads a paper gets a re habit of reading papers right so you, you it, that person starts reading papers because of you right so that's a good thing that would happen uh, for our future scientific generations uh um, which brings me to my next point uh time constraints right now i under, uh, sagar has told me that um uh, these these were two separate projects uh, that were presented uh and and you know i'm sort of contradicting myself here uh saying time is important and i've been blabbering but you know i feel it's important for you guys to sort of learn take away something from this experience uh time constraint is very important so try to keep yourself as short as possible right uh, and and that again goes hand in hand with the fact about how much are you revealing in your presentation how much are you talking about it in your paper so it's sort of again a trial and error method that will help you realize how much should you present and that will help you with your timing in the presentation right because not everywhere you're going to get half an hour or one hour to present some some places just give you uh, you know if you if you go into some intercollegiate fests at this stage or something uh, they give you just 10 minutes to present with 5 minutes q and a something like that or if it's a bigger uh, platform if it's a national conference and there are a lot of people there right it's on on international or an international conference there are a lot of people who are waiting to present so you barely get 20 minutes to present your stuff and 10 minutes for q and a so you have to be able to adapt to do those situations by realizing how much time do you have and by uh, sort of fixing how much do you want to reveal in your presentation and how much do you leave it for the audience to go back and read your paper Right, so that's again a trial and error thing that comes with experience, and uh, I, I feel you guys have started on that on uh, on that road, and uh, I I wish you best of luck. Uh, my last point is uh, has to do a bit specifically with Anandu. Uh, it's a good idea to not use your phone to present. Right? That's not a good thing to do. Um, I mean, little. I mean, speaking a little a little bit honest, you know, a brutally honest. Uh, you it, it's a good idea to maintain some level of professionalism uh, but when you do that with your phone when you're presenting with your phone no matter what the situation is right uh it's it sort of degrades your presentation a little bit right reason being it's, it's quite simple right your your phone has other applications that will interrupt with notifications right now every single thing matters when you are at bigger stages right uh, and it it is a good idea to avoid as many mistakes as you can right from the very beginning now what you've done here is fine right because this was sort of your very for very first stages of uh, presenting stuff and everything but do keep that in mind uh, no matter what the situation is do not use your phones to present or do anything during a during a formal presentation right do not even look at your phones uh, if you're presenting in an offline session and people are looking at your face uh you know even if it is to attend a call or you know just some notification pops up it's always a good idea to put it in dnd and then keep it aside right and if it has to do with presentation and if you don't have any other means send it to someone who can present like what happened today you had to send it to sagar and sagar was presenting that is still acceptable right but using your phone is not a good idea right so uh, these are the things that i had about the presentation and uh, and the papers look really good um i was really happy to see that you guys have applied everything that uh, you've learned in um, latex although i did see a few equations that were not typed in latex i hope you have your reasons for that and that's okay right i mean you're still starting out so that's fine um but otherwise everything was great um, i'm really glad to see you guys have worked hard on a very interesting topic 
and I hope that you will carry it forward um, and, and perform actual experiments to learn more about uh, whatever it is that you've picked, uh, picked here and uh, wish you all the best guys. Awesome. Great job. Thank you. Um, sorry, I yapped so much uh, and, and I didn't mean to offend you, but it was really good. Right? Uh, don't worry about that. Yeah, thank so you for can... the feedback. Yeah, yeah, thank you for the feedback, Vikrant. Thanks, Vikrant, for valuable feedback. Yes. Yeah. Okay, guys. If anyone have any doubts, you can ask now. If not, thank you for joining. And does anyone have doubt? Okay. So I don't think there is any doubt. So thank you all for joining, and uh, uh, all the best, Hari and Anandu, for your work. Well, I'm going to go to the next one.